mid-19th century, the United States, specifically the southern states, had a near monopoly in the cotton supplied to Great Britain. These states attempted to leverage this economic power into political power, trying to sway Great Britain to formally recognize the Confederate States of America. There is no doubt that monopolies have power that perfectly competitive firms do not have. In this chapter, we will find out how monopolies gain and maintain monopoly power. We will also study how monopolies maximize their profit by determining the best output level and price for their product or service. A natural monopoly is a term for one way a firm may gain or maintain monopoly power. In this market, the demand curve intersects the long run average cost curve at its downward sloping part. A natural monopoly occurs when the quantity demanded is less than the minimum quantity it takes to be at the bottom of the long run average cost curve. Natural monopoly firms can be found in the energy sector like these power companies. Here are some more ways that monopolies form and maintain their monopoly power. Controlling the physical resource used to provide a product or service like in the instance of diamonds. The firm De Beers controls most diamond mining resources. Legal monopolies, like the United States Post Service, have government backing and regulations to provide monopoly type status. Pfizer and other pharmaceutical companies use patents, trademarks, and copyrights to protect their monopoly powers. Large, well-known corporations like Microsoft and Google may use tactics such as intimidation to help protect their monopoly power. A perfectly competitive firm is a price taker and perceives the demand curve that it faces to be flat. The flat shape means that the firm can sell either a low quantity or a high quantity at exactly the same price. A monopolist is a price maker and perceives the demand curve that it faces to be the same as the market demand curve, which for most goods is downward sloping. Thus, if the monopolist chooses a high level of output, it can charge only a relatively low price. Conversely, if the monopolist chooses a low level of output, it can then charge a higher price. The challenge for the monopolist is to choose the combination of price and quantity that maximizes profit. In other words, it makes the price through the output level it chooses. Total revenue for the monopoly firm in this graph first rises, then falls. Low levels of output bring in relatively little total revenue because the quantity is so low. High levels of output bring in relatively less revenue because the high quantity pushes down the market price. The total cost curve is upward sloping. Profits will be highest at the quantity of output where total revenue is most above total cost. Of the choices, the highest profits happen at an output of four. The profit maximizing level of output is not the same as the revenue maximizing level of output, which should make sense because profits take cost into account and revenues do not. For a monopoly like this one, marginal revenue decreases as additional units are sold. The marginal cost curve is upward sloping. The profit maximizing choice for the monopoly will be to produce at the quantity where marginal revenue is equal to marginal cost. If the monopoly produces a lower quantity, then marginal revenue is greater than marginal cost at those levels of output, and the firm can make higher profits by expanding output. If the firm produces at a greater quantity, then marginal cost exceeds or is greater than marginal revenue, and the firm can make higher profits by reducing its quantity of output. Note, this is how the output level is determined, but extra steps are needed to determine the price and ultimately the profit. This figure begins with the same marginal revenue and marginal cost curves from the previous slide. It then adds an average cost curve and the demand curve faced by the monopolist. The firm first chooses the quantity where marginal revenue equals marginal cost. In this example, the quantity is four. The monopolist then decides what price to charge by looking at the demand curve it faces. The large box with quantity on the horizontal axis and marginal revenue on the vertical axis shows total revenue from the firm. Total costs for the firm are shown by the lighter shaded box, which is quantity on the horizontal which is quantity on the horizontal axis and marginal cost of production on the vertical axis. The large total revenue box minus the smaller total cost box leaves the darkly shaded box that shows total profits. 
since the price it charged is above average cost, the firm is earning positive profits. Here are three easy steps to determine the profit of a monopoly. In step one, the firm chooses the profit maximizing level of output by choosing the quantity where marginal revenue equals marginal cost. In step two, the monopoly decides how much to charge for the output level by drawing a line straight up to point R on its demand curve. Thus, the monopoly will charge a price P1. In step three, the monopoly identifies its profit. Total revenue will be Q1, quantity one, multiplied by P1, price one. Total cost will be Q1 multiplied by the average cost for producing Q1, which is shown by point S on the average cost curve. To be P2, profits will be the total revenue rectangle minus the total cost rectangle, shown by the shaded zone in the figure. So here's one question to wrap things up. Why does the marginal revenue curve for a monopoly stay below the demand curve? The answer is because the market demand curve is conditional. That is, as price changes, the new price impacts all units demanded, not just the increase or the de decrease in units. When we look at marginal revenue, that is tracking just the increase of revenue for each additional unit, not total units. 